Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler, and I want to talk to you about some exciting new uh, research. So I want to talk to you about the TRAVERSE trial, in particular the TRAVERSE trial as it relates to prostate and prostate cancer. So the TRAVERSE trial, as many of you know, was uh, the largest randomized controlled trial of testosterone therapy versus placebo ever, and by far, originally uh, intended to look at uh, cardiovascular issues. Um, those results were published um, in mid-2013 and showed no increased risk of cardiovascular study, uh, cardiovascular risk. Other studies have since been published looking at other endpoints such as sexual function and mood, but what I want to talk to you about today is prostate cancer. So this uh, this was, you know, once they had this large population of men, over 5,000 men, um, you know, they asked the question of what what else can we investigate here? What an opportunity this is. Um, and so they had some pre-specified plans around uh, how to investigate prostate. In this trial, there were 5,204 men. They all had low levels of testosterone. Ages were 45 to 80. And uh, because the original intent was cardiovascular trial, all these men had cardiovascular disease or uh, were at high risk for events. Men with PSAs above 3.0 were excluded. Men with very high voiding symptoms were excluded as measured by the IPSS. And the follow-up here was 33, uh, mean, mean follow-up, 33 months or 14,304 person years. This is a big, big study. And um, for prostate safety, um, what they planned and what they did was that all of these men got a PSA at baseline, and again, at three months, 12 months, and then annually. Digital rectal exam was part of this, and it was performed at baseline, 12 months, 36 months, and at the end of the study, if it happened later. And, um, and they had pre-specified uh, requirements for who would get a biopsy. And so, and those were if the PSA increased by more than 1.4 nanograms per milliliter in the first year, if the PSA uh, rose above four at any time, and for younger men, 45 to 54 with PSAs less than 1.5, if they had a PSA that rose above just three at any time. Prostate nodules or in duration was also a reason to do a biopsy. And every elevation in PSA that may have triggered a biopsy was repeated to confirm that it was true. Uh, here are the results. Total number of cancers, 12 in the testosterone arm, 11 in placebo arm, almost identical. High-grade cancers, which was really the primary endpoint for the study, defined as Gleason 4 plus 3 or higher, 5 in the testosterone group, 3 in the placebo group, very few in number, no difference statistically. And amazingly, um, uh, urination symptoms were no different between uh, the uh, testosterone group and placebo group. In fact, there are no differences for any of these. And the reason why the urination thing is, I think, uh, worth, <laughs> is a big deal, is that everybody has assumed that not only does testosterone, for the longest time, that testosterone sort of move, causes prostate cancer, prostate cancer growth, but also that it has the same effect on benign prostate. Um, that turns out to not be true. So there's several implications from this. One is, I think this is now done. Testosterone therapy does not increase prostate cancer risk. Uh, we're never going to get a bigger study than this. Um, the results are unequivocal. Uh, it just does not increase prostate cancer risk. Number two, in testosterone deficient men, testosterone therapy does not cause prostate cancer to grow. Now, where do you, how do you get that from the TRAVERSE trial? Well, we know that as many as 15% of men who have low levels of testosterone, or frankly, even who don't, if they're in studies or protocols where everybody's getting a biopsy uh, with PSA less than, with normal PSA, normal digital rectal exam, 15% have biopsy detectable cancer. It shows up on biopsy. Now, in this study, that wasn't true. You had to have certain changes, right, that would that would result in a biopsy. But we know that there's a lot of subclinical prostate cancer out there. And if testosterone really made those subclinical cancers, let's just call them cancers, if it made them grow, 
it would be logical to assume that some of those would become detectable by the monitoring methods, uh, changes in PSA, in duration, nodularity, and that they would then get biopsies and it would show up. It didn't happen. And I think the clear implication is that testosterone therapy, raising testosterone, does not make those existing foci of cancer in men's prostates grow. Three, testosterone does not drive prostate cancer growth. This phrase has been around for a long time. The prostate cancer guys love this. Androgens drive prostate cancer growth. If it, as a general statement, which includes especially people who are not androgen deprived, this cannot be true. It didn't happen in this study. We don't get more prostate cancer with a rise in testosterone. Therefore, testosterone does not drive prostate cancer growth. It's not true as a general comment. Maybe true in the androgen de fit androgen deprived population. That's a special case. And why doesn't it do it? Saturation. There is a maximal amount that androgens can stimulate prostate cancer or normal prostate to grow. And at some point it becomes maximal and raising it beyond that concentration doesn't do anything. That's what saturation is. Men who are testosterone deficient still have a moderate amount of testosterone. They just have little enough so that they have symptoms. Um, but raising it doesn't seem to do anything in this study and in other studies that led up to this uh, traverse trial. So it um, doesn't do it. So I think this is massive. I think this is massive news. Um, we make decisions in medicine based on, uh, especially on large randomized controlled trials. That's what this is. The results are not wishy-washy. They are clear. They are definitive. They are conclusive. Testosterone does not cause prostate cancer risk to go up. It does not seem to make prostate cancers grow in this population of testosterone deficient men. And hopefully this changes the conversation about how we speak to our patients and how we speak to other uh, clinicians about testosterone therapy and its merits and its potential risks. That's it for today and hope to see you back on this platform again soon. Bye-bye now.